Hello, my name is Nikita Petrov, I'm the host of today's episode, and then the topic of today's episode is the Church of Scientology. Uh, its strange history, its structure, the belief system, the view of the world and the human mind uh, proposed by the founder, L. Ron Hubbard, the allegations of abuse, the practices, the fascinating question of what made Scientology one of the most successful cults in recent history, and then what keeps it going still. And then the person who is going to explain all of this stuff to me is Tony Ortega, a journalist who has been covering this topic for more than 20 years now. Um, you may have seen him on the HBO documentary Going Clear, or maybe the more recent TV show Scientology in the Aftermath by Leah Remini. And then if you find this conversation interesting, you can see more of his work on his site, TonyOrtega.org. Uh, it's just a fascinating, incredible archive of stories and materials about the church, but also uh, a source of news, you know, it's, uh, he's, he keeps it updated, and it's kind of fascinating uh, how not even close to being over the story is. So, without further ado, this is my conversation with Tony, I hope you enjoyed as much as I did, thanks. All right, Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Nikita. Uh, I want to congratulate you on your recent, uh, I guess it's not an award, but like maybe a badge of honor. You got enlisted, uh, got into the Hall of Bigots, it's called, according to the Church of Scientology. That's right. That's right. They've got a new website up with a rogues gallery of us, and I'm one of about two dozen people they've selected to call religious bigots. Right. You're in a good company. And I saw that there's like, there's a little bit of competition there. So Louis Theroux, who's uh, an author of a really good documentary, my Scientology when we tweet that he was sad to not make it. Yeah, he was disappointed. But, you know, Alex Gibney's up there and Lawrence Wright and John Sweeney and Brian Seymour, all journalists I really admire. So I'm happy to be in their company. Well, uh, it is earned in the sense that you have done a lot of work and uh, you've been uh, uh, writing about Scientology for like more than 20 years now, right? That's right. Since 1995. Uh, a lot more recently now in the last five years than previously. But um, I keep an eye on them every day at my website. And, uh, you know, there's just so much happening in Scientology now. Uh, I just try to keep on top of it. I think it's valuable to cover it as a daily beat, daily news beat. So what do you think are, I mean, I, I'm totally with you. And uh, I kind of fell down the rabbit hole myself. Uh, you know, first you watch one documentary, then another uh, and then I told you I went even, even went to my local Scientology center here in Moscow when I ran out of documentaries to watch. Um, but it's not, I mean, it's fascinating because there are so many different moving pieces and elements and so many of them are kind of strange and weird. But there's also, uh, like, why do you think this is also meaningful to cover? Why is it not just a curiosity about a small group of people uh, stuck in it? Well, Scientology in Russia has its own issues, but for, and I'm interested in those. But um, one of the things that fascinates me the most about Scientology is that it's able to operate inside a country like the United States when its values are so contrary to American values and, and that it somehow takes advantage of of American courts, American laws, American values, and just, you know, turns them upside down. And they've been able to get away with it for so long, for 60 years now. I just, I find that fascinating. You know, I mean, it's just one tiny example that from 2004 to at least 2009, David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology, was literally running a prison at their main compound for his top executives. And there were up to about a hundred top executives stuck in this room, this prison he created for them, and they couldn't leave. They couldn't communicate with the outside world for five years. And you know, it's just incredible to me that Scientology can do that kind of thing inside of a country that prides itself on freedom and liberty and that kind of thing. So this is one of the uh, elements that really stands out. This kind of totalitarian aspect to it. Right. Now, when you say prison, it, I was kind of confused as I was watching these documentaries. There's also this element, did I get it right that it's kind of a uh, like a trap for the mind that is if you just decide that if you stand up and leave, you're actually going to be able to leave? 
but since there's barbed wire and guards all around and all of that other stuff, people just don't, people have to like plan an escape instead of just walking out? Well, it depends on what part of Scientology we're talking about. I mean, I was just mentioning that, that int base it's called, which is this um, secretive compound in California. There's definitely fences there and barbed wire and 24 hour guards. And uh, the people who have made it out of there, like Ron Miscavige, father of the leader of the church, uh, Mark and Claire Headley, uh, John Brousseau, uh, the people that have left all tell us that they had to literally escape. They had to plan out their escape very carefully. They had to use very sophisticated and complex, you know, ways of getting getting away. Um, and I, I don't. I have no doubt that there are people still there today who are not entirely there of their own will. But one of the complex things about a group like this is that, you know, as experts will tell you, the bars are really inside your head. And this is what makes it complex for law enforcement. I mean, the, the, the FBI came very close to raiding that base in the summer of 2010. But, you know, one of the things that made it difficult for them was that they could raid that base, open up that prison I was talking about called the hole. And tell the prisoners, okay, you're free to leave. And they might say, no, we're, we're here of our own will. And that's a real risk. That's really bad for law enforcement, which is why they don't raid the base. It's, it's, it's difficult because it's so much about the human mind and human conditioning and what sort of uh, requirements Scientology makes of its people. It's really fascinating, I think. So listen, we kind of jumped into the thick of it with the prisons and everything, but you're right that it's uh, it's the prison itself is about uh, largely about uh, the human mind, but also the Scientology itself. It starts with it doesn't start with the totalitarian aspect. It doesn't start with the weird beliefs about space aliens, which I want really want to get to because I think that's sometimes also kind of glanced over as just a curiosity. I think there's more to it. But there are many of these fascinating elements, but both historically uh, as like how Scientology developed and from a point of view of somebody who might stop by a local center, it doesn't start with any of that. It starts with the figure of the founder and this book that he wrote uh, in 1950, I guess it was published, The Dianetics. So let's start at the beginning. Who was L. Ron Hubbard right. uh, in 1950? And how did he get to writing that book? L. Ron Hubbard is a very fascinating guy. Uh, there's no question, lived a very adventurous life. Uh, he would, they would say about him that he'd lived enough for 12 men. And in some ways that was true. He had been a uh, pulp fiction writer. He had, uh, was served in the Navy in World War II. Uh, as a teenager, he traveled in places like Asia. And, <clears throat> I'm sorry. He'd done a lot of interesting things. And then in 1950, he turned away from science fiction, which was his one thing he was most well known for, and wrote this book in which he claimed he was the first person in history to finally understand the human mind. And he, he claimed that his discovery was so major, literally the first line in the book is that Dianetics was on a par with the discovery of fire. <laughs> and what he claimed was that he had learned that the human mind actually has two halves, one half called the analytical side, which is this perfectly recording computer, but we're never able to take advantage of it because we have this other half called the reactive mind, which stores all of our traumas and things that happen to you as a child, uh, some traumatic incident. What happens is later as an adult, something happens around you that re-stimulates that earlier memory. And, it can cause you a lot of pain and, and, and problems, and you don't even know why. And so what Hubbard proposed was going back, just talking with another person called an auditor, to try to remember what those early incidents were, discover what those traumatic memories are, he called them engrams, and then remove them by simply talking about them. In other words, it's another version of psychoanalysis, right. but, but he didn't call it that. But, you know, it's the same thing. You go back and you talk about your childhood. You talk about what difficult things you went. What made Dianetics so unusual was that Hubbard was saying that this was a real thing, that this reactive mind was something he had discovered, that this was a science. 
but that the most powerful traumatic memories that you have stored up, you acquired in the womb as a fetus. And all of the examples in the book are bizarre, like rough sex between mom and dad while mom was pregnant with you is what is really causing you problems as a 40-year-old adult. <clears throat> very strange. But it became very popular. And in the summer of 1950, Americans formed these clubs where they were t- trying to help each other remember, okay, what did you go through when you were in your mother's womb? Uh, now, you know, 60 years, 67 years later, there's still zero evidence for the existence of the reactive mind. There's no evidence that the human mind works this way. But at the time, it was very popular, and that's where things got started. It changed a lot, though, in a couple of years because, first of all, after some early popularity, it all kind of went crashing down. Hubbard went bankrupt. He even lost the use of the word Dianetics in court. And so he regrouped, he restarted things over in 1952 in Phoenix and this new thing he called Scientology. Now, the difference between Dianetics and Scientology is In Dianetics, you're trying to remember what you went through as a fetus in the womb. In Scientology, you're trying to remember the engrams, traumatic memories from previous lives. Mm -hmm. It's a very big difference. And not everybody who, not everybody that liked Dianetics early on were willing to go with him on that because, again, he had advertised it as a science. And going into past lives didn't sound like science to some people, right? But that's, that's the big difference, and that's what Scientology is, is you're trying to remember things that happened to you thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, billions of years ago. And by 1952, he had also acquired this device that they call an e-meter that's supposed to help you confirm those memories. So in a session of auditing, you're trying to remember some terrible thing that happened to you 10 million years ago on another planet. And what the auditor is doing is watching how the needle moves on the on the e-meter to help you figure out, okay, yeah, that's a that 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 really happened. That's a real memory. That's a very powerful suggestion for somebody. I've talked to Scientologists that have left, and they now realize that they were just dreaming this all up and there was no reality to it. But when you're when you're really into Scientology and you've been doing it for years, and the auditor is telling you that the needle's moving properly it can really convince you that you're remembering actual things from 10 million years ago. I've done an auditing session as uh, this part of my anthropological, you know, uh, excursion. And it is kind of spooky and kind of weird. I mean, mine was fine and kind of lighthearted. And I even got the sense that the lady that was uh, was being the auditor, she approached it as kind of, like with a chuckle she's like this is, we're gonna do some weird things now i'm gonna snap my fingers the whole business um but even without the e-meter just because you have to you have to remember things you have to start adding details to the story you so how the, the editing works is you go over this traumatic experience in my case i just remembered like she she asked for a the earliest stressful memory. So I remembered when I was, I didn't want to eat the food that people gave me in the kindergarten. So there was no real weight to it. But, you know, you tell the story once, she goes, okay, now start over. You tell the story again, and then you have to add more and more details that I don't remember. My the, my whole memory of that incident is there was some food that I didn't like at the table, right? But you have to add element, uh, like details to it. And uh, I didn't do it with an e-meter, actually, but she, they have this thing, they call it uh, a file clerk. So she addresses a part of my psyche that knows how things went down. And so I'm imagining, I have to imagine more things. So I'm coming up with more details. And when I say, I mean, seriously, I'm making this up right now. I have no idea what actually happened. She's like, okay, I understand that. Let's ask the file clerk. And she asked the file... Hello? Oh, you froze for a second. Do you hear anything yeah. okay now? <clears throat> yeah, I think we're back now. Okay. And so you, you go through this and you add in more and more elements to it. And uh, by the end of it, I know I made all of this up. But that doesn't help even me, myself. Now, when I think back to that memory, my memory has changed because I've talked about it for an hour. 
And all of these details that I came up with are now there in my head. Now, if that was, you know, not a, a harmless childhood food incident, I actually went there because I was depressed because something, you know, and I did have a traumatic childhood and I talked through it so many times and I came up with this new narrative and they don't stop that they don't stop until you start like laughing about it. Right. You, you're supposed to get cheerful about the incident. Yeah. And, and this you, 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 you really hit on a key component of Scientology and that is repetition. They will ask you the same thing over and over and over and over, and they and they're trying to draw out of you, like you said, details that aren't even there, <clears throat> and you will fill in those gaps, and it does produce a hypnotic state, and this is a this is something that Scientologists will angrily dispute because there's no question, according to Hubbard's uh, friends, that he was. A stage hypnotist. He was one of these hypnotists that put people up and do an act with them, and he was very, very good at it. So that's before and Dianetics, right? Before Dianetics, he was known for being a really effective stage hypnotist. And if you look at how auditing works with this constant rep repetition, um, <clears throat> you know, experts will tell you this is to uh, create hypnotism. And that that's de definitely what Scientology is about. But um, Hubbard had a had a slogan. He said that uh, that uh, th what we're doing isn't hypnotism. Well, you know, hypnotism puts people to sleep. What we're doing is waking people up. Hmm. Right. That's that's what that's what he was saying. Scientology was. But really, it is it is putting you into kind of a mild trance state, and it's through so much repetition. They ask you the same. I remember. Uh, you know, you're talking about the low level introductory things, right? But it's same at the same at the highest levels. There's a a thing called superpower they do now that's that's relatively new, and it's not on the bridge, but it's a separate thing. And the um, bridge is it, it, you're referring to this sort of path or a hierarchy of levels the, or the, states. The bridge is the is the uh, right. The, the bridge is the regimen of courses and auditing levels that take you through your whole journey of Scientology from your $50 initial course up to the very top of the bridge at you're, you're talking $800 an hour for mm -hmm. auditing and, and near the, near the top of the bridge, there's this thing called superpower. And I, I, uh, I talked to a, a former top technical person in Scientology about it. And he gave me one example. The, Superpower is made up of several different what they call rundowns. And we talked about one rundown in particular, <clears throat> which will cost you ten I'm saving you ten thousand dollars, Nikita, by Thank you. by revealing this to you. <laughs> um, what you get for this ten thousand dollar price is it's called the Bright Think Rundown. And you sit with your auditor and the auditor asks you a question. And that question is, where do you feel safe? And you're supposed to come up with a response. And like you said earlier, yeah, the question is asked again, and this time you've got to come up with, you know, you got to keep coming up with details. That's all it is, is the question, where do you feel safe? Asked over and over and over. And I, I couldn't believe it. I said, that's worth $10,000, really? And uh, the person I was talking to about that said, well, Tony, you know, if you answer that question 300 times, you'll be amazed at some of the things you come up with. I mean, that's hypnotism. That's trance state. That's, you know, that's what it's trying to... Or produce things like you said that that aren't even real. That you're just trying to fill the gap, but that's what Scientology is. And I guess if that's closer to the end of that bridge, that means that you've by that time you have received all of those pieces of secret knowledge pertaining to your actual nature. And we'll get to that in a second about the. So there are all of me, these. Yeah, go ahead. Let me make an important point. Um, you bring up an interesting point. You're right. It, it, it is similar. So you're doing something. You you gave a very good description of what the initial kind of auditing was like, and I just gave you an, a, a sense of what some of the high level. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there's a continuity that they're fairly simple. Well, here's what's what happens along the way, is that you're asked to do something called keeping Scientology working (KSW). It's a very important policy, and it starts to be laid into you fairly early on that 
this is not a game. This is, you know, Scientology is the be all end all. You have to be totally committed to this thing. Tom Cruise talked about it in that funny videotape that was leaked. KSW, he says. Uh, uh, yes, the, the initial courses do seem kind of light and they're not high pressure and they don't seem very spiritual or weird. But right from the beginning, they're starting to give you the idea that you need to give yourself up to this process and that eventually this needs to replace everything else in your life as far as you can't do other religions, you can't do yoga. I mean, you know, everything becomes Scientology and only, not just Scientology, but only the most standard kind of Scientology according to L. Ron Hubbard. And it's your job as a Scientologist to keep the Scientology pure. So there's definitely an indoctrination and conditioning being laid in besides this auditing that we're talking about. And this doesn't only have to do, my feeling was, it doesn't only have to do with like uh, improving your life, right? Because it gets intertwined with a larger picture. There's this whole space opera mythology to it. And then at some point you become, I guess this is when you, get really serious about it and go uh, after like there's a threshold but don't they sign a billion year contract that they're going to be responsible for this segment of the sector of the universe well <clears throat> the what you're talking about is employees not everybody okay. works for the church but so you can but, get but, to to higher levels but still not be uh yeah in, in this inner structure right but um but you do though you're you're getting near something really important i think and that is earlier on the space opera and the science fiction was a much bigger sort of draw to scientology if you talk to longtime scientologists people that got into the 60s and 70s they'll admit to you that they were science fiction fans and they liked this idea that they were joining a group that uh you know i mean there was something exciting to the idea that you're going to remember what happened to you 10 million years ago on another planet? And so joining Scientology meant joining this worldview where we're all part of this major Star Wars narrative. And so there was definitely an appeal for the, the early people about that. I think today they tend to suppress that a little bit more, which I think is a shame because personally I think that's some of the most fun stuff. If, if you go listen to the early lectures, Hubbard is talking about how – you know, he was a time traveler. He went through all these previous lives. In one tape, he talks about how 40,000 years ago, he was a race car driver on Earth. <laughs> right. I mean, race cars, 40,000 years ago. And that it was part of this earlier civilization on Earth. And it was uh, really advanced um, uh, race cars on a track that was booby-trapped with atomic bombs. So if you if you took a wrong turn, you'd, you'd blow up the whole city or something uh and he talked about traveling to venus regularly and mars and tripping through space and there was definitely a, a sense that l ron hubbard the science fiction writer had become sort of l ron hubbard the science fiction guru right uh, and those early lectures were filled with these claims i mean he he said that the <clears throat> he he wanted people to think that there was this grand space narrative going on that most human beings were ignorant of. And that by joining Scientology, he was letting you in on this larger story going on where our solar system was actually known as Space Station 33. And there were invader forces that were on Mars and Venus. And when you die, your soul, which is called a Thetan, leaves the body and then goes to Mars or Venus, gets new implants of the mind, and then comes back to Earth and starts a new life in a new baby. So uh, listen, I want to I want to flesh out this. Uh, I guess we can we can go to this famous Zeno story, uh, sort of the kind of a creation myth for Scientology. But before we go there, yeah, do you have a sense of like it sounds that uh, when Hubbard wrote Dianetics, uh, it is at least plausible that this is a genuine uh, attempt to come up with a theory of mind that would help people in their daily lives without like the added uh weirdness like and i guess i i think i've heard you say that uh the idea about the past lives was not even his right uh 
Yeah, that's true. It, it, there's no hint of past lives in Dianetics. It, like I said, the idea is to go back to the womb and try to remember what you experienced as a fetus. And I honestly, I don't know how much of that was his ideas, but he he liked people to think that some of his followers wanted to go back farther, and he kind of went there reluctantly with them. Now, I think John Atack, who's the real historian on this period, would tell you that that was just sort of a marketing uh, move okay. and, that, and that Hubbard was as interested in past lives as anybody. But at least publicly, he wanted people to think that it was his, it was his followers who were demanding that right. they go farther into past lives. Now, do you have a sense of of sort of the ratio between his actual beliefs or convictions or practices? I guess he like did that, like audited himself, right? And then certainly a, a big part of the structure that he later developed is there to, uh, you know, I mean, past lives are a great device because you can audit indefinitely you can remember exactly. more and more past lives and right. and and the stories that that uh, some of them you mentioned like they 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 look almost intentionally silly with the atomic bombs on the on the race car uh, track so do you do you is there a some sort of an understanding of how much of this uh, thing that he developed was his actual uh, you know belief, like how much he bought into his own thing well you're, you're asking me was he a con man or did he really believe what he was saying right i mean right. that's the big that's a big question everybody asks and um it's well i'll tell you one thing that i uh, discovered and that i put into my book about paulette cooper was that in the uh, summer of 1972 paulette worked with hubbard's son l ron hubbard jr and paulette was also, a journalist right Paulette Cooper was a journalist. She was one of the first people to write a book about Scientology, which came out in June 1971. And the following year, 1972, she spent the summer working with L. Ron Hubbard Jr., who also went by the name Nibs, was his nickname. And the thing about Nibs is he kind of, he would be a, he would be sort of with his dad and, in, you know, in, in his father's favor. And then he would break away and, you know, say bad things about his dad and back and forth and back and forth. So in the summer of 72, he was out of Scientology. He wanted to expose his dad. And so Paulette worked with him for a few months to put together this really well done 60 page piece of writing where it's, it's Nib's version of watching his, you know, watching Scientology develop with his dad. And he, he really characterized his father as a, a very self-conscious uh, hypnotic con man that was really, you know, had found a way to convince people that he had all these secrets and was and would, would impart them to you and was taking advantage of people. However, what he also pointed out was that it was so successful that over time he began to believe his own creation. And I think there's no question about that, especially Lawrence Wright makes the point if he was just a con man he would have left with all the money. I mean, there, there was so much money. And he, and he ended up just leaving it to the church, right? Half a billion dollars when he died. He left to the Church of Scientology and only gave his children like $10,000 each, right? Uh, and the other thing that uh, some of us point to is at the very end of his life, he was still auditing himself. He was still trying to chase away these ent invisible entities and stuff. Auditing so, himself is doing auditing like f on himself or auditing other people? At the top levels of the bridge, you learn what's called solo auditing. And you start auditing, you learn how to audit yourself, okay, but only so at the very top. That. And he was auditing himself and he was trying to chase away what they're called these body things, which we'll talk about Zenu and we'll get into that. But so I, I think based on what Lawrence Wright said, based on what Nibs told Paulette, I think that there's probably some truth to that, that he may have started out knowing that he was turning a parlor trick into a, uh, a, a, a lucrative business, but that, you know, he started to believe his own hype. He started to believe his own myths about himself, that he really was this great scientist who had brought this, you know, new discovery to, <clears throat> to the world. But he had, he had some early problems early on 
One of which is, I mean, the nature of a science, if this really was a science, and the reason I stress that is if you, if you look at the first book, Dianetics, the subtitle of Dianetics is The Modern Science of Mental Health. He sold this as a science at first. Well, the nature of science is that if a, if a person makes a discovery and it's, and it's an actual true discovery, then another scientist can discover it for themselves and replicate those results. That's the nature of science. Science is not owned by one person, right? So people would you know, get into Dianetics. And they'd say, you know, this, is re- this really is a good science. I like how it's helping my mind. I don't need Hubbard. I'm going to go make my own discoveries about it. Well, that drove him crazy. He hated that. And the cynic would say it's because he's losing that income, right? And so uh, in the, in the, after this, developing this, you know, Dianetics and Scientology in the early 50s, in the later 50s and in the 60s, a lot of his time was spent uh, writing all these policies and rules and control uh, to try to keep people from leaving, to keep people from taking out the materials. And Scientology becomes obsessive about what they call, what they call ethics, which I think is just a uh, euphemism for control. So that's, that's what uh, Scientology really becomes in the 60s. And also... The other thing to keep in mind is that from the beginning, the goal everyone was chasing at that time was something called clear. As you erase those negative, in your case, uh, you had that memory of the food when you were a child. And so the point was talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And, and And what happens is whatever was painful about it goes away because you've talked about it so much. And that's a real phenomena. I'm not, you know, that's and that's not original to L. Ron Hubbard, but that's a real phenomena. Other therapists use that as a way to help you deal with something. Is if you talk about it so much, the pain goes away. Well, Hubbard Hubbard's theory was that as you were doing that, <clears throat> you were actually erasing that half of your mind called the reactive mind. And if you could completely erase it, you became clear. Then you would only have. Your analytical side of your mind is a perfectly reporting computer. You'd, your IQ would go up. You'd have total energy. You'd, you'd, be, uh, you'd have perfect recall. You'd be impervious to sickness. Basically, he was promising superhuman abilities. Uh, and so by the mid-60s, he started declaring people clear. They had reached that plateau. So what does he do next? He puts things beyond that. He moves the goalposts and he puts new levels that he calls OT or operating Thetan. So it wasn't enough to reach clear. Now, the Scientologist would tell you that he's made new discoveries. Yeah. Again, the cynic would say, well, how do you charge money if they're already – if they've finished clear, right? you gotta, you got to put other things out there for to spend money on. So he had to come up with what are in these operating Thetan levels. And it's OT3 that is the most famous. And this he came up with in 19, uh, I believe it was 1967, 68. At that point, he was running Scientology from a ship. And they were docked in the Canary Islands. And that was, uh, that had to do with, like, getting to the neutral waters so that the government doesn't get to them, right? He had to leave the United States because, he, cause, you know, they were, when I said that, you know, impervious to disease, right, they're making health claims. Well, back then, not so much today, but back then the U.S. government took that kind of thing very seriously and he got investigated. So he left the United States. <coughs> Sorry, he went to England from 59 to 66, had huge success there, but then the English government started investigating him. So in 67 – he decided to take Scientology to sea. And so from 67 to 75, eight years, he ran Scientology from a ship, a little group of three ships, but he was on one ship called the Apollo. And it was on that ship in 1968, I think, where he came up with this OT3 level that's so famous. And did you want to... Yeah, so say- that is that is the level where you learn about this Xeno story and the... the- space opera and cosmic drama unfolding uh, in the background. I just wanted to preface, I want you to tell the story, but I wanted to yeah. preface it with, um, it is important that the context in which one receives that story is important, right? So it's, 
you're in Scientology for some time now. You've spent a lot of, not just money, but also time and effort doing these auditing sessions. And then you're, you finally reach a point where you're going to get this incredible piece of information about the secret knowledge about, uh, uh, you know, the universe and your place in it. Right. And then I, I heard Leah Remini uh, explain kind of the context of that. You know, she went there. Her mother was a higher level than her. Uh, and her mother was there because she was so excited to see her daughter receive this information. Yes. And you're in a room. You're uh, There's a suitcase with the secret knowledge attached to your body because it's so important. Uh, there's a, some person who's revealing this to you. You're like given this piece of information. You're, there's like some magic box or something and handwriting of Elrond Hubbard. So it is, I almost feel like, uh, you know, talking about motivation of, of Hubbard, whether he's a con man or a, um, or a believer, I think there is a third sort of option there. I mean, he was a writer. There is something exciting for him. There was something exciting to him about writing stories, making up stories to begin with. Well, you're yeah. really up in your game if instead of inventing stories for pulp fiction, you're inventing realities for people to live in, right? If, you, if you're if you in Scientology, you buy into this story, that becomes, that's not just you something you read in the book. Then you now have to live with it and now you have to, when the next auditing session comes, that's going to be become, that's going to become part of your practice well he he yeah he he was a showman too i mean he was definitely an entertainer and he knew how to produce an effect uh and not just at ot3 but you i mean even before dianetics came out in 1950 he was telling friends that he had a manuscript that was that was going to change the world so much that he'd only showed it to 12 people six of whom had immediately committed suicide right <laughs> And of course, then you know you're like, oh my god, I want to see that, but I'm afraid to. See, see, he knows how to get people pumped yeah. up, which is ridiculous. I I've read. There's one person, a couple, a few people have read that manuscript. One of whom wrote wrote about it and said it was so dull. There was nothing. If they committed suicide, because out of boredom. But <laughs> anyway, so but the anticipation actually starts much earlier than what you're saying with OT3 because when you're when you're just coming up in Scientology. And you realize there's this progression. Well, where does the progression lead, right? And very early on, you start hearing from people. Well, well, just wait till you get to the OTs. Then you'll, then you'll. So they start building that anticipation for years. And so imagine how you're feeling when you go into that room and they bring out the suitcase and they're opening it up. I mean, the buildup is incredible. Now, there's a couple other things to. I mean, I know people know this story from South Park, the cartoon, but there are other things to keep in mind. Another thing that makes this unusual, first of all, I, I do want to point out, it, it drives Scientologists crazy when you call it a creation myth or an right. origin myth, because it's not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hubbard's uh, concept of the universe is that the physical universe we inhabit was created about four quadrillion years ago by some thetans who were bored, and then they got trapped in their own creation and part of the sort of narrative of Scientology is is that eventually we'll be able to cast off these physical bodies and, and regain those incredible powers that allowed us to actually create the universe. See, that makes perfect sense from a point of like, that is a, a writer's kind of perspective on reality, right? These are narratives that we're creating. We, or, or, and it's also, it's also, it has a long tradition in, in, uh, in philosophical thought. Right. I mean, it goes back to Gnosticism, the idea yeah. that there's this sort of boring vessel that we're inhabiting, but inside of us there's this godlike creature trying to get out. That's an old, old, old concept in human thought. So that's going on. But, but there's another reason why OT3 and the Xenu story is remarkable to Scientologists. One of the things that is most characteristic about Scientology is when you were going through that session you were going through, you were being asked to tell her about an incident you had with food as a child. She wasn't telling you what she went through, right? You were being asked, this is a key concept, and one of the things I think people need to understand if they're trying to struggle, they're struggling with the idea of what is the appeal of Scientology. One of the main appeals of Scientology 
is it's all about you. From your first day to your 10th year, every single auditing session is tell me what you remember about yourself. Tell me what you are feeling about yourself. And some people love that, right? It's it's compare that to uh, say something like you know Christianity or 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 Judaism or or Islam, where you're in a group with other people that you know you like, and that's fine. But you're being told about things that happened 800 years ago or 2,000 right. years ago to somebody else. They're not asking you about you. They, you, you know, you're in fact, you know, you're supposed to give yourself up to this larger story, right? But in Scientology, it's all about you. And it's actually a rule that the auditor cannot correct you, cannot tell you anything. All they can do is ask you questions. They can't say, no, you got that wrong. That's not what happened. No, no. That's that's like the one of the worst things an auditor can do. It's called invalidation. An auditor can never invalidate a preclear, a student. And so when you so when you learn the framework about the cosmic drama, you then Well when you well, he has, well, Hubbard all along has been talking about some sort of things going on in the universe and that kind of thing, but it's not part of your auditing, right? This is why OT3 is so shocking to people because whether you're going through the grades or clear or OT1 or 2, again, you're still being asked to remember things that happened to you, what, what's going on with you. OT3, you sit down and here's this handwritten material from Hubbard and he's telling you – that 75 million years ago, which sounds like a long time, but now that we remember that it's a four quadrillion long year, right. you know, it's not really that far back in Scientology terms. 75 million years ago, this galactic overlord named Xenu ruled 76 planets and he had an overpopulation problem. And so he brought these trillions of beings or billions, I don't remember the number, to the Earth, which was then called Tigiak, blew these people up, captured their souls brainwashed them basically with these mental images and then left them on earth to inhabit animals that then took you know went through evolution and eventually became human beings and so now that there's two shocking things to that to a scientologist first of all for the first time in your entire scientology career they're not asking you what you remember about 75 million years ago they're telling you what happened 75 million years ago and that this happened to you and that the Thetan inside of you went through this and he's helping you remember it. This is shocking to Scientologists. They've never had Hubbard tell them what to remember. Second of all, as a result of that genocide, all of these unattached, invisible souls that have been brought here are attached to you. And it turns out you're not just a solitary creature, but you have hundreds and thousands of unseen souls called body things that are inside of you, hovering around you, that are part of you. And that's not good because, you know, you've been spending the last seven years of your life trying to get rid of all these bad memories from your past, right? Well, now you have to get rid of all the bad memories from all these creatures that are attached to you. <laughs> You know, when you start to think about how much auditing that's going to take and how much money that's going to take, people panic. But that's what the next four levels are about. OT4, OT5, OT6, OT7 is different ways of chasing away these body things so that you can get back to just being one entity. So uh, before I, I want to spend more time on this, but uh, before we go there, do you... I'm not imagining that this is like intentionally weird. The stories he comes up like in that story about the the genocide, he says that the spacecrafts that they use to transfer uh, the, these creatures to Earth was remarkably similar to this one particular plane in in American Air Force. Right. No, not Air Force. DC eight passenger planes. Oh, okay. So, like. To add that element there is, to me, it sound, started into sound like a, a, a satirical story from Kurt Vonnegut or something. Like it's, is, is there an element there to, why, 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 us, why to make that so strange? Well, some of us have always felt that Hubbard was always trying to be a little outrageous as a way of trying to, it was almost like he wanted to be caught, that he was just making stuff up. 
I mean, think about it. He's selling you a bridge. I mean, it's the quintessential con, right? I mean, he's, it's, it's like he's being almost too obvious. He's selling you a bridge. And now he's, I mean, and the, the Zenu story, I mean, it's, yes, you, you, and, and some of the names he comes up with are so outrageous. You think, did this, this guy was trying to make them see that they were being fooled and they could never see it. And there's this, uh, the, in that same story, uh, so after the genocide happened, the souls were captured by some electric devices or something, and then they were right. trapped in 3D movie theaters and shown right. movies. For 36, for 36 days, they were shown, they were given the R6 implant, which is this series of mental image pictures stored in the mind, and they include all the modern religions. So when Hubbard says that, what he's saying is that Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad are all constructs artificially placed in our minds by Zenu, the galactic overlord. But isn't and there, a, there's like a, a recursion here happening. You're sitting in a room being, I mean, in, in my cases, I, this is not probably true for like the 60s and the 70s. But in, in my case, it was additionally ironic because all of this introductory stuff in a, a modern Scientology center is done through, they have a movie theater you're shown a movie and so you you start this path with people are showing you the movie about what your reality is now going to become and then 10 years later after all of this money and effort spent you're told that what actually happened is your whole reality is false because you were shown a movie 75 million years ago right there's exactly it's like he's mocking the person who's going to believe this anyway Right? You know, and if you listen, if you listen to his lectures, and I know it's hard because they're they're tough to get through if you're not a Hubbard fanatic. He's 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 really belittling people. You know, he's really I don't know. I just felt like he was trying to see how far he could push people, and they would still follow him. You know that uh, I don't know that he had much respect for the people that followed him. There's a really interesting story that came out recently. Uh, a journalist in 1968 tracked him down when he, when he was on that ship in uh, Tunisia. And uh, he had a film crew with him, but he was all by himself. It was late at night, and he just happened to get lucky and catch Hubbard alone. And they had a talk for hours in the middle of the night, nobody around. And this guy claims that Hubbard admitted to him that it was all a con, but that he felt he, he had become a prisoner of his own invention. And that he had all these people following him, and he kept trying to come up with crazy stuff, but they believed him no matter what he said, and it got to the point where he was he felt trapped by it. And I don't know, you know, that's it may be apocryphal. I've I've talked to the guy personally myself. He seems like he's on the level. Uh, but I, I think there's an, an element to that. When you look at Xenu, you know, it's just so over the top. But here's another thing to keep in mind. So after you read that material within his handwriting. You're then asked to do some auditing to confirm that there are these entities around you. And, and that's it. You never talk about Xenu again the rest of your career. That, that whole, that whole in, interaction with the Xenu story might last an hour. Right. And you're in Scientology for 40 years. And so that's why a lot of Scientologists really resent, I think, the South Park thing. And, and, and that's so for – from like about – the the 90s through the early 2000s, all anybody wanted to talk about in the press was joking about Xenu. And it drove Scientologists crazy because they knew that it was like one hour out of their 30-year career. Uh, but, you know, for those of us on the outside, we look at that and think, how could you stay in? And that's an interesting question to ask people. If you ask former Scientologists – uh, and uh, you remember Leah's reaction, right? That, right. Or or Paul Haggis's reaction. They co they couldn't believe it, and and some of them some of them walk away. A few, not very many. Uh, others just like, okay, that's fine. I'll move on to the next thing, you know. But it's it's a shock to them again, not not because it's a weird story, because they're used to weird stories, but because for the first time, Hubbard's telling them what to remember rather than them telling the auditor. But then, so there is also another thing we should mention is, for most Scientologists, Scientologists, I guess, like how what what fraction of Scientologists do get to level three? 
I one time I had lunch with the spokeswoman of Scientology. Her name is Cor- uh, Corinne Powell. Uh, way back in like the year two thousand, and she told me only about ten percent get that heart. Get that. Heart. And so for those ninety, they don't get to listen to that story. And if they find it out on Google somewhere or somebody, they get it. They get in trouble if they even ask about it. Right. And for people on the higher levels, if they disclose the story to somebody who's not prepared, that person is going to get pneumonia because the knowledge is so important, is so heavy. Right? They believe that they believe that Hubbard almost died getting that information. That he had to go through what's called the Wall of Fire, and he broke his back or something and had pneumonia and almost died. And he now and so then he told people that the information was booby trapped. And so that you cannot do OT3 until you've done all these other things and you're prepared for it. And even then, you're not supposed to tell anybody because it could hurt them. Yeah, I mean, it's just... Okay. On the one hand, you could say, well, yeah, it's secret knowledge. It needs to be preserved. On the other hand, you say, no, that's what you do to make sure people pay what you want them to pay. <laughs> sure, yeah. So, but then, uh, so you receive this this piece of knowledge it becomes you're not talking about xeno anymore but it becomes the framework for your daily practice right well then like i said for the next four levels you're spending years removing body things all the way through ot7 and it's incredibly expensive i mean ot7 all by itself can cost seventy five thousand dollars, and that's just one of those four levels where you're removing body things. And finally, when you finish, and OT7 is the toughest one to finish. It can take people years. Finally, when you're done with OT7, supposedly you've chased away the last of the body thetans. Now it's just your body and you, you the thetan. And then you go to OT8. So and- let, me, let me clarify that. You're a thetan and then the, there are body thetans. And are those different sort of classes of creatures or is just too many of you are stuck in one body or what well uh, you know the supposedly the history is that there were all these you know people that xenu was their leader and he brought them all to earth and and destroyed them but trapped their souls so so at some point they were part of some person that lived on another planet somewhere and but 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 what happens was when when he released them on Earth after the implants, the movies, 75 million years ago, there were no human beings on Earth, right? So they had to attach themselves to, to other creatures and live th- with them through evolution. And so that's why they talk about a clam stage, for example. He actually has a book called The History of Man where he talks about how your Thetan at one point was living inside a clam and, and that there's, there's a way of knowing that today by the way your jaw works i'm serious i'm telling you you have to read this book it's one of the weirdest books of all time and that's why some of the critics of scientology uh started a website called operation clam bake and why and why some people will refer to scientologists as clams okay so but then so the, the reason I'm, I'm trying to figure this out is um again i i heard leah said say though uh, I, i'm not sure how like she kind of said it in passing, but she said that at the end of this thing, at, at OT8, you are kind of told that not like you're not, or maybe you've cleared off all of these body things or whatever, but you at the, you end up with you're just you. So I'm trying to get the, the idea of who you are in this in this whole system of belief. Right. The ultimate goal is to become an operating thing, which means that you can leave your body at will and you have you can be what's called exterior with full perception, which means you're not only free of your body and can go wherever you want, but that you have all of your senses working. You can you can affect matter with your mind. Uh, and they have these magazines where they they basically tell these ghost stories to get people pumped up for it. And I'll never forget one person claimed she left her body in California traveled to indiana uh performed surgery on somebody and then came back to california and got back into her body so this is the dream of scientologists but there's a there's another reason why you want to become an operating thing and this really is the ultimate goal of scientology and and, you know look only a certain percentage make this high not even all scientologists realize this big picture i i have come to realize but I actually listen you know, to Hubbard's lectures and, and his books and look at what he's saying. 
what Hubbard was talking about was that there are these what he called invader forces who are currently on the planets Mars and Venus, and they're at war with each other, and they're sort of like keeping an eye on us here on Earth. When you when your body dies and your Thetan is released, one of them is going to grab you. They're then going to implant you with false memories so that you completely forgot who you were this past lifetime, send you back to Earth, you start life in a baby, and you basically start all over again, which means you're going to have to join Scientology at some point again, <laughs> go through the whole thing. I mean, this is not so dissimilar what, to like a, a a Buddhist or Hinduist version of. Re I mean, with different language and different narrative. Right, but, you're not going to inhabit an animal or something. You're going to be you're going to be another human being, but you have to start over again. You have forgotten everything, and you're going to get a new reactive mind. You're going to lose sight of the fact that you're billions of years old. So what Hubbard was trying to do was not only re remove the clear the reactive mind and become clear. But then become an operating Thetan through OT8, so powerful that when, when this body dies, the invader forces on Mars and Venus won't be able to touch you. And then you could go directly into a new body remembering who you were and still remembering your millions and billions of years of, of existence. That's the ultimate goal, according to Hubbard. Is then you be, then you really become a part of, of, about the Thetan and its history, rather than this particular body. See, and that's when you can exert godlike powers. You've defeated the invader forces. You can go lifetime to lifetime without being erased. Uh, you become this godlike creature. That's the ultimate goal of Scientology and the operating Thetan levels. The problem is, in 67 years, they've never exhibited any of these powers. <laughs> sure. Um, can you tell me about this last level? So I, I read on your side, you have a, there's a whole segment on your side called Up the Bridge, where you go through this whole uh, uh, hierarchy of levels. And the most, the, the one, I, I mean, I haven't read all of it, but, but the last one really stood out for me because there is this, controversial again material uh, written by Hubbard about a, a new a meta narrative for that, that includes Jesus and Buddha and the Antichrist so can you tell me about that what what is yeah the revealed so, so you know so like I said Hubbard came up with OT3 in 68 and, and generally the rest of the OTs after that and uh, so this was all super secret material and 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 it, the first person that mentioned it at all, was uh, a guy named Robert Kaufman who wrote a book in 1972. He was the first one to mention the name Zenum in print that I know of. And then in 1981, uh, Richard Leiby, writing for the Clearwater Sun, told a little bit more of it. And then in 1990, the L.A. Times guys uh, wrote a, a lot about it. But the way it really got out to the public was that, in a, in a big way, was through a lawsuit uh, that came out of the Time magazine thing in the 90s uh not important to go through all that but basically at some point all of the ot levels were put into a court file and it got out to the public and it was just like wow you know this is incredible and uh there was just no question that here is ot3 here's the xenu uh, story four five six seven but ot8 the church was saying, that's not OT8, that's a hoax. And for the longest time, I think most critics agreed. And they looked at it and said, it's so ridiculous, it's got to be a hoax, right? Because in it, as you said, Hubbard reveals that he's the Antichrist and the Buddha and that, you know, it, it just it's so strange. And everyone said it was a hoax. Well, uh, I wrote a story about a guy named George White who uh, talked about going on OT8 when it was very first offered. O See, um, you know, they were very careful about how they released these levels. Some of them didn't even come out until Hubbard was dead, including OT8. They finally released OT8 in the, the May 1988, two years after Hubbard had died. 
and only when they had bought this private cruise ship called the Free Winds. And to this day, the only place you could get OT-8 is on the ship. But, so the summer of 88, George White was among the first few hundred people who went to the ship to get that. And, and he tells me, no question, that what he was given on the ship, and he has a certificate to prove it, which I posted online, but with the date and the number and everything, no question that what he was given on the ship was that crazy document where Hubbard talks about, he makes some asper- casts some aspersions on Jesus, he's, he reveals that he's the Antichrist. He says that and, the, 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 the phrase that stood out to me is, uh, the, he, he's saying that the, the Jesus that we know, the image of Jesus that we know is typical Mar- Macarb or whatever the name of the the Markab Markab yeah. PR. This is like what right. these aliens do all the time with their stories. And George said that's what that's what they gave, but they only did it for a few months. They realized it was a disaster. Miscavige got rid of it and replaced it with something else that's more generic today. Um, but that you know George is George is a real thoughtful guy, and he's written a book about it. And and he um, he just says it was like the ultimate prank by Hubbard that you had gotten through all of this sort of what you thought was sort of this high level philosophy and, you know, Scientologists think of themselves as being very superior to the rest of us and that you're doing this. And then at the end, he kind of plays this trick on you. Like, no, I'm the antichrist. This is all, you know, uh, turns out the the biblical story is true after all. Uh, but that, that that only the opposite reaction. I thought that it's, it's because it's like the narratives become the narrative gets to include all of these other religious narratives and and i'm i'm I'm, i was trying as i as i was reading these stories as silly as they are and as uh you know strange as this whole system is i was trying to figure out whether he's trying to convey some sort of a, a a meaning to all of this and there's like it seems that he's yeah there's like cruel kind of humor to all of this yeah. but it's kind of getting to maybe try to, to to get people to realize how not only all of these narratives that he invented they they you know lived in for all of these years are just narratives but also you can now create your own narratives like that's the the the, the nature of reality is we're coming up with stories and we always live in a story that is not entirely true is, am i putting too much here or no, I can see that. I think that Scientology does uh, encourage you to sort of, you know, make yourself the hero of your own space opera to a certain extent, definitely. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. I read that OT8, original OT8, as really such a kind of a cruel hoax on his own people in a certain way. And uh, and you know, you know what I think that always comes to my mind I, before I worked on Scientology, I worked on American literature and and I was always struck by uh, Mark Twain writes about one of the things that made the West what it was, was that, you know, the, the Western United States were all these new towns where there were always new people coming in from the East. And so you always had the people that had been there for a while. And then you had what they call greenhorns that were brand new. And inevitably the new person comes to town wearing their nice clothes and they get robbed. They get, you know, mugged they get ruined and then they become part of the local you know they, they've had this and so what do they do they play that trick on the next person that comes okay and i've always felt that scientology had that to it that everybody that's saying oh wait till you get to ot3 you're not going to believe it wait till you get to ot8 it's incredible but you know that they know that it's garbage and all they're doing is they want to victimize the next set of people the way they were victimized. I mean, I, I kind of feel that way about OTA in particular. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a bizarre document. And uh, I, I think that, you know, I, George White and, and Dr. Stephen Kent, I think we're both convinced that this, this you know, I was convinced this is a, a genuine document. So let us change the uh, the dimension of this this whole story that we're talking about. Uh, uh, alongside with this kind of uh, spiritual progression or whatever you want to call it, 
there's there, there's a hierarchy of these like spiritual levels. There's also a, a rigid hierarchy of of the structure itself, of the system itself. Yeah, let's get back to what you would ask me about um, the billionaire contract. So there are various populations in Scientology, uh, the largest of which are called publics. These are people that are paying these money to go through these classes. They're incredibly expensive, but they don't work for Scientology. They they tend to target people with a lot of money. They, they tend to be white people, uh, middle class, upper middle class. <coughs> and, you know, uh, they have to... I mean, I've asked them, I said, how, how do you go to flag and do a, a two months of a course and keep a job? And they said, well, that's one of the challenges of being a Scientologist is you've always got to work out these elaborate ways of, you know, giving them incredible amounts of money and still holding on to your job. And they all go through that. Well, what if you don't have a lot of money? The other, the other populations are staff and Sea Org, uh, people who work staff. Uh, sign five to uh, two and a half or five year contracts. They work at the external orgs, like the the uh, your typical church in a big city is called an org, uh, a class five org, and there will be a staff there. These are people that work. They get paid like minimum wage, uh, so not a lot of money, but uh, but it you know they they might room together to save money. They might have a second job. Uh, but they're very dedicated, very dedicated people. They do, like I said, sign two and a half year to five year contracts. But then there are people who join the sea organization, the sea org. Uh, the name comes from the original group of people that were on the ships with him. They were called the sea org. And then when it transferred to land, they continue to call it sea org. They continue to have naval ranks. They continue to have naval uniforms. They have the uniform. They, they salute each other. There are golden medals involved. It Everybody is very... sir. Yeah. Everybody is sir, whether it's a man or a woman, it's sir, sir. And uh, yeah, you sign a billion year contract. Um, you have to give up what call, are called life histories, where you talk about every single thing in your life, every sexual encounter, every embarrassing secret. It's all written down. Uh, and they own you, man. I mean, it's it's 16 hour days. It's a hundred. Uh, there's an interesting court case going on in Los Angeles right now. We got some documents out of it. This uh, woman, Laura DiCrescenzo, she signed her billion-year contract when she was 12 years old, and when, as a 12-year-old, she was working 90 hours a week and uh, seven days a week. And they, some weeks they don't get paid at all. The most you'll ever get paid in the Sea Org is fifty dollars, but typically you'll get paid something in between. And then when she turned 13, they moved her to the adult schedule of 112 hours a week. So that can't be legal, right? Well, but they call the ministers. And so uh, they get around labor laws by, calling, by, by saying it's religious work. Now, she wasn't doing any religious work. She was working files. But they call her a minister. They get around labor laws. They get around child, child labor laws. I mean, they're working 13-year-olds. 112 hours a week for pennies an hour. So it's all because uh, this is also a thing that uh, that constantly confuses me as I you know hear more and more stories. Like there are so many elements to it that you kind of wait go well how how is this still happening, and is it mostly through this religious uh, sort of angle that they uh, ev evade um, confrontation with the law? Yeah, I mean no question. I mean. The um, there's a couple that uh, California couple that a few years ago filed a fraud lawsuit against Church Scientology, claimed that they were lied to about the way their money was taken, and the judge wouldn't consider it because he said, "Look, they're protected by the First Amendment, and you know they you sign you signed a contract that you have to do their internal arbitration. I can't touch it because I can't get inside the workings of a church, and so I mean this protects them from criminal charges." Um, and they're, you know, they're working children around the clock and it's just, it makes it really difficult for law enforcement to do anything about it because those first amendment religious protections are so strong. Okay. So let's talk about how this thing works. So there are, it, I was kind of surprised by, you know, it, everybody brings up that it sounds, uh, some of the structure sounds very much like the early Communist Party or something like that. You There are these knowledge reports that people write on each other. There's a snitching culture. It's a, it's a snitching culture, right. It's snitching. It's an interrogation culture, right. 
And and that, that's why people ask me, um, you know, you know, going the movie Going Clear is in theaters now. The movie, you know, Leah's, Leah's series is in TV. Isn't that gonna Isn't that gonna affect people in the church? And I say no. They don't watch it. They know that if they're caught watching that kind of material, they're gonna get hauled. Somebody's gonna turn them in. Somebody's gonna snitch on them. Probably their own kid or their own spouse. Even Leah Remini talked about turning her husband in numerous times for things that he had done. <clears throat> and once you're called in. <clears throat> You then you then have to go through what's called a sec check, right? And if especially if you're an upper level person, a sec check is short means security check, and it's an interrogation. And security checks are done in what's called an intensive. An intensive is twelve and a half hours of questioning, which cost uh, ten thousand dollars each. You're paying for your own interrogation. You're paying to be interrogated. So it's like Eastern Germany, but you get a bill. <laughs> But it's not just the employees that face that. So do the publics, right? The pub, the people that <clears throat> don't work for the church, they can also get hauled in for interrogations. And what happens is you might be accused of the most trivial thing, um, and, but they'll kick you out. They'll, they'll, it's called declare you a suppressive person, which is their label for an enemy of the church. Right. Short, it's called SP. Well, if you're declared an SP... Everybody else in the church who wants to stay in the church has to cut off all ties with you, even if it's your own family, your own spouse. So we have a, we have a really amazing uh, audio recording at my website <clears throat> where a woman went through one of these interrogations, and we acquired a recording of it. And she was being told by this ethics officer that she was in trouble literally for watching Leah Remini on Dancing with the Stars. And for, you know, a few other things, communicating and sending an email to Mike Rinder, for example. But the thing that always sticks in my mind is they literally, he, he, that's literally a crime. That's really a crime to them that she watched Leah Remini on TV. And she, oh, and she watched a Lawrence Wright interview on television. And she was being declared for that. And you hear her in this recording telling this young guy, do you know what you're doing to my life? My husband's going to have to divorce me. Because her husband was, you know, very uh, dedicated Scientologist, and uh, she went home after that recording and went to tell her husband. And I just at the look of her face, he realized you've been declared, haven't you? And uh, he knew he either had to divorce her, or if he wanted to stay with her, he'd get kicked out of the church too. And he decided to stay with her, and they both left. But that's the kind of thing Scientologists face every day is, you know, that's why they're so good at policing themselves is they know the consequences of watching this, you know, broadcast of you and me. You know, if anybody catches them watching this, they know they could get hauled in, interrogated, <clears throat> charged thousands of dollars and then kicked out, their family ripped apart, their business destroyed. You know, it's very serious stuff. So this is very reminiscent of like the Stalin purges or something. The 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 sort of the, the height of paranoia in the Soviet Union. That you have the enemy of the state as a label for somebody. If somebody right. is labeled that, then uh, I mean, in Soviet Union it was harsher because people would disappear and, and most of them would be killed. Right. But it is what I'm getting it is it it is very similar to. A totalitarian state is just I was doesn't say, have a territory, all, a land all, all high control groups, all totalitarian groups work the same way. If you look at some of these other really you know intense groups that are accused of this kind of thing, they all have the same ways of recruiting people, ways of conditioning people, ways of indoctrinating people, ways of disciplining people, splitting up families, hiding information from people, scaring the crap out of them, destroying them. It's amazing how similar they all are. They all use the same groups. And it, whether we're talking about nations or cults or whatever you want to call it, uh, they all use the same techniques. You know, one of the things that kind of uh, stuck with me as a, you know, a feeling as I left that, uh, the church in Moscow, uh, I was talking to a friend and we both agreed that there is a, you can see how somebody 
you know, being if the circumstances were slightly different, or if I was slightly different, if I was not as skeptical as I am, or whatever, um, you can see getting drawn into this, and then the the trippy kind of thing is like we ordinarily we we like there are all of these structures in the world. There are governments, there are churches, there are businesses, there are corporations. There's always a, some sort of a power game going on in all of them now the narrative that we ordinarily accept is governments are the one governing the ones governing and and sort of these nation states are legitimate authorities and they make sense like this if somebody joins you know if somebody is a registered democrat that's fine that's a person's trying to uh participate in the life of the society if somebody is a part of a cult, that's just an unfortunate thing that happens to some people and you kind of can't, you know, it's just might as well not pay attention to that. Now, I can see how that whole thing is completely reversed if you, you know, maybe went to Scientology when you were younger or maybe maybe they helped you early on. And I mean, they do have like these auditing sessions. They do help some people. You get more confident or you deal with some of your problems. Even if you do learn about some of the difficult things, like there is a prison or something. Well, our governments have prisons. Our governments commit, you know, war crimes and whatnot. Well, with Scientology, uh, it helps you personally. It has power. I mean, when I went to that to that church and, and, and saw all of these movies, it's pretty like they're showing all these volunteers working all over the world. Uh, helping people in Africa, he helping people in Russia, handing out food, handing out books. There's a, uh, a claim for a scientific truth at the core of it. Again, kind of similar to the parallels that I saw with the, the Communist Party were eerie, kind of. There's, it also starts with a truth that we have discovered about how societies progress. Well, here you have a truth that you've discovered about how what a human being is. And then it applies to everything. They have all of these, um, you know, one of the stands that they had, you can click and, and choose like the topic. And if you're struggling with discipline in your life or setting goals for yourself, you click on that and they have a recipe for this. They right. have eight steps or whatever. If there's family life that is troubling you, you get an answer to that. So it makes sense on all of these different levels. It has answers for all of these different things. And it seems to be really successful. They do have money. They do have all of these beautiful uh, buildings all over the world. They say that it's expanding. And then, so it, it, it is helpful to you. It is doing all of these beautiful things all over the world. It does have power. People refer to the president of, the, of, of America as the most powerful person in the world. But Obama couldn't close Gitmo year after year and kept promising it right so there's the, like what we the, the amount of power we ascribe to these different institutions depends on the interpretation of events and if you're in Scientology you can see it as both powerful and useful and then if somebody joins a political party well that is just unfortunate some people get into this politics thing right and 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 just get sucked in like the the picture can be completely reversed and 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 other organizations might seem like cults while our, uh, Scientology would seem like the the one worthwhile thing to do well i think uh, what makes uh Scientology so hard to break out of for some people is that they buy into that idea that there's this certitude to it that you know <clears throat> Uh, like when you said, uh, you know, you have a particular problem, they they give you this check sheet. Well, I think you you and I probably both agree that when you have a certain problem, there are certain suggestions for how to take care of it. But that doesn't mean that it's like the only way to do so. But Scientology offers this idea. If you just follow this check sheet, take this course, pay this fee, your whole life is going to be great. I don't think life works that way, but for some people, that's very reassuring. And then as you get into it more, you start buying into this idea that actually Scientology has all the answers to everything and that the problem is 
the other people are all deluded, degraded beings that can't see what a bad situation they're in. And we're the so you become part of this exclusive club. You start to feel superior. This is why they love the movie The Matrix. Is they love the idea of you know waking up and realizing how awful things really are, and everybody's just walking around in a dream. They're like, that's Scientology. That's We are the only ones that know what's really going on. There are many well, groups once, like that, thinking that when, they are the ones woken up. Exactly. Well, once you buy into that idea, it's a very powerful idea. Then, when somebody says, oh, you're in a cult, you're an idiot, how could you do these things? It just reinforces to you that they don't get it. They don't, they're not part of our group. They're the problem. We know what we're doing. And so I mean, Paul Haggis explains that in going clear that actually in some ways the criticism, the press, all works to reinforce people's belief in Scientology. That's what I, I always have people come to me and they say, Tony, how can people believe this stuff? How can they really you know, keep following these? I said, you got to understand that they have bought into an idea just like you and I have bought into certain ideas that Absolutely. probably – we should be shaken out of, but we can't, you know, but they, but these are ideas that take over their lives completely. And, and then they become so easily manipulated to split up families and separate parents from children. It's really not a good thing. And, um, another thing, you know, Paul Haggis pointed out in the movie was, yeah, at first, those first few levels, when you're starting to communicate better and you get some, you know, relief from some of these traumas, you know, it does feel like it's, it's helping you. Well, the mistake people make is thinking that it's something Hubbard discovered that's helping them. When it's not. These are just basic psychological processes that other practices use of, you know, lessening the trauma of early and memories and stuff like that. But these Scientologists ascribe everything to Hubbard. And then as as Paul was saying, the higher up you go, the less effective it gets. But then you're bought in, and it's like, okay, now by the time you're at OT3, it's so crazy, and you know they're not gaining confidence anymore. They're just trying to not get in trouble at that point. You know, don't get interrogated because that's just going to cost you another four thousand dollars worth of interrogation. You know, and it becomes terrifying, and ultimately they all leave. You know, I mean, there's still a hardcore people left, but you know we're seeing people coming out now that were in Scientology for 30, 40 years. And ultimately, just realize that you can't do it anymore. Was there a significant change when Hubbard died and David Miscavige took uh, reins? Not, not a significant change right at first, because Hubbard had been gone for years uh, in hiding. And he had been running things behind the scenes. Uh, so when, when Miscavige took over after Hubbard's death in January 86, um, it went it went pretty much the way it had for a while. I mean, obviously for those people around Miscavige, life changed very quickly. You can talk to people like Lois Riesdorf, uh, who are close to Miscavige at that time. And he was pushing people out of the way. And all. But for your average public Scientologist, I don't think things changed that much, but it's really a kind of amazing that they kept going because most groups like this, I think have a difficult time surviving the founder. Uh, and, and you have to give Miscavige some credit that he did keep it going. And they were very, very fortunate that just a couple of months after Hubbard died, Tom Cruise started. And he became their number one advertisement and really helped save them. Uh, and that's why I think today Leah Remini is telling people, you know, Tom Cruise could single-handedly probably bring this down. I don't... I, I, I might, might need a little convincing on that. I'm not 100% sure that's right. But it would definitely hurt them. You know, No question, it would be a big blow to Scientology if he were to leave. But I don't see any signs that he is. I think he's still very dedicated, and he's still their number one symbol. Uh, and, but, but there's definitely been a lot of changes since uh, uh, at least the late 90s, early 2000s. Things started to change. But Scavage started to enforce certain rules more strictly, ramped up the fundraising, uh, has really made it much, much more intense. There's still all ideas that Hubbard put into place about things like disconnection and ethics, but 
but how, but the scavenge has taken it to a level that's driven a lot of people away. Is there? Uh, so I heard. I think a lot of people say in, in many of these uh, documentaries or interviews, they talk about the decline in popularity of Scientology. Is that different based on where you are? Because I was when I went to the Moscow uh, thing, I was ex- I expected that to to be like half empty, and it was not. There were new people coming in. There was staff members. People doing these different uh, practices. There are there are there are a few places in the world where it has not declined as much as it has in the U.S. and Australia and England. Russia is one of them. Uh, other parts of Eastern Europe, they're still uh, recruiting. And Taiwan, uh, they're doing. They're actually growing. I think in Taiwan, uh, they're aggressively recruiting in places like Venezuela and uh, Colombia. Uh, but yeah. The interesting thing about Russia is that they have had um, steady numbers of people and new people at the same time that the government is cracking down. I mean, that Moscow facility has been raided, I don't know, six times or something like that? That was a confusing element to me because when I googled Scientology Moscow, the first like page of Google results is how Scientology is no more, but all of these stories are a few years old, and the building is right there, and it has a beautiful sign and everything. I, I mean, that probably, I mean, if I know anything about how Russian system works, corruption and money and bribery is involved. Um, there is no, but they're not a religion in Russia. They are considered a destructive cult officially. Um, so I guess like different territories have different challenges for uh, a group like that. No, it's an interesting story in Russia right now because they, it's all these raids have happened, not just in Moscow but some of the other cities, and um, but it's not going away. Um, I think part of it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think part of the appeal in Russia is that it's associated with the United States, yep. and that and that things that are American have a kind of appeal of their own. Yeah, um, and I would have, and I think. Both association with the United States and like when you go into that, I also imagined, you know, uh, now it's less of an appeal. But if you imagine going, stopping by that same building and I'm imagining it, it probably was as, you know, pretty as it is now because the church had more money probably at that time. Um, As the situation within the country is getting worse or is just not improving and you're stepping into this. People are dressed up very professionally, and uh, they are, the staff is, um, I mean, these auditing sessions and drills are probably doing something because they they look very professional. They stare you in the eyes. They uh, you get this general feeling of this thing seems to be working for 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 whoever is on the inside, and then yeah, you can get. I saw actually when I was getting uh, my American visa in the line, there were two girls who were going to America through Scientology. They had the little pins and the little, like, contracts to show... Um, They're probably to, going to, to Florida. Ambassador. So, yeah, there's. I think that's a part of it. And the other part is uh, going clear. It's not in the movie theaters. Yeah. You know, um, well, there's probably not much critical information over there. But, well, you meant, what might help under, uh, explain the, the, the appearance of people in, in Moscow Scientology is that I've noticed... That in Russia, there's more of an association between Scientology and its business consulting wing called WISE, W-I-S-E. In the United States, um, they also have this thing, WISE, uh, which are basically Scientology front groups that operate as business consulting firms. And they tend to focus on dentists, chiropractors, and veterinarians. And it's always been around in the U.S. They've always found that a way to recruit people through these businesses. But it's not as big a deal here. Russia, the wise element of of Scientology is big. And I think there's a a greater association in the mind of people over there between Scientology, this U.S. thing, the celebrities, and the idea of being in business that it's, and I think there's more of that sense there, which is probably why people might be dressed more in business attire when they're doing Scientology there. That makes sense. Now, is there? Um, I, I've I've heard about 
like a clash within Scientology, maybe not within, but people who left Scientology, some of them are trying to organize and shape, form their own kind part, you know, type of Scientology. Is that is is that happening? Is there like a a promise for those uh, uh, endeavors to to grow? That's always been a part of Scientology from the very beginning, from 1950 onwards. There have always been people who left the organization and wanted to do it on their own. And, and remember, part of it was that it's a science, right? So you can do it yourself. And so there were always these splinter groups. And they were, people would come up with their own names for it. But um, there have always been what are called free zone or independent, uh, RONS orgs. Very, very, uh, there's been a, in Europe in particularly, but then especially in the last few years, as people were leaving, they were leaving not because they'd lost faith in Hubbard and the ideas and the auditing, but because they just couldn't take Miscavige and his fundraising anymore. Sorry. So you saw a lot of people leave after, two, in 2007 in particular, Miscavige did this thing that really, really angered a lot of Scientologists. He reissued all the books and demanded that everyone buy them, even though they already had copies. And a set of books and lectures was $3,000. And every Scientologist was ordered to buy multiple copies of it, right? Okay. And it just it just came off as such a cash grab that a lot of people left. Anyway, when they left, they, they didn't want to stop auditing, right? And so they wanted to keep doing in, in, uh, Scientology on the outside. Now, what I've found... You know, as I've talked to these people, is that for many of them that only lasts so long. They they come out of Scientology, they think, okay, good, I'm going to get back to what I really love about Scientology. I'm just going to audit. I'm not going to be involved in those fundraising events. I'm not going to you know, be sec checked, and my kid's not going to go to the Sea Org. I'm just going to audit and have a good time. I come back a year later and talk to them and say, so are you still auditing? Oh no, I got rid of all that. So that's so for some a lot of people. That independent Scientology phase is a temporary one on the way to being completely done. Other people keep auditing for decades. I mean, I, there are people today who consider themselves independent Scientologists who left Scientology in the 60s, and they're still doing it on their own. Wow. As, far as, as far as trying to organize something more formally, um, you know, one of the things that's made it tough is that Scientology uh, over the years – has been so hardcore about copyrights and trademarks that if you if you did try to set up your own shop, uh, they would come after you with a cease and desist and sue you if you tried to use their actual materials. Okay, so for the most part, people who were operating independently just did so quietly on their own, and they had little quiet networks. Nobody was like opening a business and saying we have our own brand of Scientology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, just recently. A couple of uh, top former, long-time former Scientologists, uh, three or four people, decided, you know what, it's time we challenge the big monster and do that. And they, they formed a nonprofit called the First Independent Church of Scientology. They applied for a trademark, and they didn't get it. Uh, the, the U.S. Patent and Trademarks Office said, no, oh. it's, it's too confusing. It would, it would, it would uh, interfere with Scientology's own trademark. So they're, they've gone to a second strategy now. Because my, you know, my attorney has said he's always waiting for somebody to do this to argue to the trademark office that the word Scientology is now generic. Uh, this is what this is what happens when uh, a brand becomes a word like Kleenex or Xerox <laughs> or or you know or a uh, 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 oh, dumpsters right. What, you know, the, I don't think most people realize that garbage dumpster is a brand name. Anyway, they become generic. Right they become a they become generic and then anybody can use that to advertise themselves you know as whatever uh, and so that's my attorney has always said he's waiting for well, somebody should argue that Scientology is a generic term and anybody can use it but this this group did try and didn't get very far so now what they're trying to do is get a license from the Church of Scientology to operate independently which I don't think is going to happen uh, but there are some groups now. CNN in a couple of weeks is uh, this new Reza Aslan series called Believer coming out, hmm. where he he kind of becomes a Hindu for a week and then he becomes a Muslim for a week, whatever. And 
he's he's gonna he apparently did a uh, an episode about these independents, and I saw him interviewed, and he's trying to make the case that there are like these Scientologists all over the world that just want to do their religion on their own. I think he's exaggerating things. I don't, I, you know, Danny Lemberger is a guy I like a lot. He's in Israel. They had a Scientology mission that broke away and became independent, which never happens. I mean, this was a huge deal in 2012. The whole mission left and became independent. Mm-hmm. And I I admire him. He and I disagree violently on L. Ron Hubbard, but I really support him and what he's doing. But he's got like 30 people, mm-hmm. right? And then in, 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 uh, in the United States, there's a guy who organizes an independent convention every year. Uh, he holds it in Reno, and last year they had 36 people. So, you know, there are probably several hundred independents around the world, but it's, it's, I think CNN is going to try to make it sound like there's, I don't know, millions or something crazy. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what Reza does on that. But, uh, but yeah, there, there are independent groups. Uh, some of the independent groups don't get along with the other independent groups. You know, there, there are splits within the independents. Uh, and, uh, look, and that and that shows you Hubbard will be around forever. Even if the Church of Scientology was to get prosecuted or whatever, there will always be people that revere Hubbard and his ideas and and, and do this auditing. I wanted to ask you about, uh, are, you, are you seeing any prospects, at least theoretically, for the Church of Scientology to uh, change? I mean, again, if we compare it to like uh, the Communist Party, you know, when it was really harsh when Stalin was in power and then we got Khrushchev who really mellowed the system out a little bit and, and, and changed the emphasis. Could the same thing happen in Scientology? And if that does happen, uh, could it, you know, survive? And then, uh, you know, 50 years later, we're talking, uh, another prominent religion. I don't think so. Um, and the reason is that I think Scientology flourished, when it did in the 60s and 70s um, <clears throat> and the 80s and the 90s, uh, mainly through maintaining secrecy. In other words, you're, you're only going to pay these incredible prices because you can't get the material somewhere else. The, un- the Internet has made things very difficult for a group like that. because so all the secrets are out. All the materials are out. It's getting much tougher to recruit new people. It's shrinking. Um, you know, Scientology's always lied about how big it is. It's always said millions, which wasn't true. The greatest extent of Scientology was probably about 100,000 people around the year 1990. And I get that from the top former officials who've all left now, you know, and they were all part of it. And it started shrinking steadily after that Time Magazine expose in 1991. And, uh, and then the internet has made it tougher and tougher. Uh, by the time that Jefferson Hawkins and Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder were out in late 2000s. They were estimating 40,000 total. And now the most recent upper-level management person to leave is a guy named Paul Burkhart. And I wrote a couple stories about him. And I and he he was working at the Hollywood Guarantee Building on Hollywood Boulevard and had daily access to the reports from every org in the world. And I said, what do you estimate as the current? worldwide membership and he said less than 20,000 wow so i think this thing is as larry wright said scientology is heading for a day of reckoning and uh, i think it's going to be continue to be tough for them to recruit people i think more and more governments are going to be interested in these stories of abuse of young people and i don't really see a sort of peaceful transfer of power i mean i hate to predict i don't know what's going to happen but David Miscavige, just like M- Hubbard, Hubbard did not groom a successor. He, he, he wrote a document that appeared to anoint uh, Pat and Annie Broker as possibly his successors, but it was very vague. He really didn't set up a mechanism for somebody taking over. And so Miscavige filled that vacuum, right? He just took over. And he's not grooming anybody to take over for him. So... Between governments getting more interested, more and more former members willing to sue, more exposure on the internet and in the media, I just don't see 
Scientology somehow swinging things back towards growth. Uh, but who knows? I mean, I, this is part of why I do what I do is I really don't know where it's going, and I'm just interested in reporting whatever does happen. Well, you're doing an amazing job, and uh, I'm sure like this conversation is going to give me a break for some time, but I, I'm sure I'll be checking out your website and then following the story. It's just so many different things intertwined into this one fascinating story that can go uh, so many different directions. And I mean, there are still, even if it's, you know, 20,000 people, there are still people kind of caught up in that thing. And a lot that's of these still, stories are that, pretty heartbreaking. That's still three or 4,000 hardcore Sea Org members around the world making sure the thing keeps working. So, you know, uh, those people are not... You see, now it's getting down to the size where it's just really hardcore people only. And they're, they're not going to walk away. So, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's really fascinating. But... But along the way, families are getting ripped apart. Right. You know, lives are getting ruined. Young people are growing up in this thing and find themselves just really dealing, struggling with it as adults. So there's a reason it's being exposed and a very good reason. And I think that, you know, governments should be taking a hard look at this group. All right. Well, let's wait for that. Uh, thank you so much for this. This was fascinating, and I really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, thank you for doing the important work. Great questions, Nikita. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Take care.